oh my God, I just made the biggest lecture and then I had to go to a staff meeting and then I came back and checked and the lecture sound is all corrupted. So I'm gonna try to make a new one of these really quick. Um, yesterday we were talking about greenhouse gases. Usually this is a huge lecture with a bunch of notes, but I'm gonna have to do something wacky because my last video was all messed up. We were talking about the atmospheric window, sunlight comes in, heat is stored. I introduced some terms in yesterday's lecture, these ones. I forgot to mention yesterday that there are natural greenhouse gases because the greenhouse effect is a natural thing. Those are water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. But for study goal number 20, I need to add the anthropogenic greenhouse gases, the quote unquote new ones. Carbon dioxide, methane, there's some others, nitrous and fluorinated gas. And you have to know so many little details. My previous lecture was 40 minutes, class starts in 14. First, carbon dioxide, the main one. Um, we've raised CO2 levels by about 50%. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we were at a level which is normally high for the planet, about 280 parts per million. Today, we're approaching 410. The best reading I could find yesterday was 409.8. Uh, that's an extremely high level. It breaks a lot of records. Um, essentially, as far as we can tell, it's never been this high. Um, we know for sure that it's never been this high for 800,000 years and pretty sure it hasn't been this high for 230 million years, which leads us to believe that it hasn't been this high since life uh, started on Earth. Um, the main sources are energy, um, burning fossil fuels for transportation and for electricity. Um, you've probably heard all this before. I'll show you some more details soon. Um, also changes in land use. So uh, when you cut down trees, um, of course, the death of those trees gives off CO2 as they are burned or they decompose that CO2 being added. Um, but also, if the trees are not there to absorb CO2, then more is left in the atmosphere. So when you build a city, you've taken away a place for carbon to go. Thus, urbanization raises CO2 levels. There's also some oddball stuff like um, landfills and making cement. Um, but CO2 is a big deal. We know that historically CO2 levels are really tightly correlated to temperature levels. Um, we also can see that the main sources are fossil fuels and industry, changes in land use. Um, and it's also neat to see where it goes. We'll talk more about this later, but a lot of the CO2 goes into the ocean, goes into life on land, and most of the extra is left in the atmosphere. Interestingly, when we look into the past, there are times that we can't find the sunk carbon. That's probably in deep sea ocean current complication stuff, but our understanding of these systems is a bit limited. This is one of those limitations. You can see that total CO2 has been rising since industrialization started. You can see that the first fossil fuel was coal. And then as we started to develop petroleum that raised total CO2 on top of coal, for a while we had more petroleum than coal, 60s and 70s muscle cars. Uh, nowadays coal is leading again. Uh, many parts of the world are developing electricity. Um, we add to coal and petroleum with our use of natural gas. Here's that cement production I was telling you about. Now, if you look in the United States, this is a US map. For the US, our main source is electricity and number two is transportation. Keep in mind, these are also our main sources of inefficiency. We talked about that in the energy unit. That's important for you to know. Um, so you should note that in the US it's electricity, transportation, industry as a large category, business and residential use, and then agriculture. Now in a place like California, that's 
different. In California, we don't have a lot of electricity CO2 because we have a lot of nuclear, solar, and wind. So you can see that in our case, electricity problem is being uh, addressed, but the light duty vehicles are a huge part of our transportation, the biggest wedge in California. Um, I actually think it's interesting to look at the countries. And if you look as a nation, China makes more CO2 than about 160 some nations on earth. Uh, China's number one, US is two, the European Union is three, uh, India is fourth, Russia's fifth, and Japan is sixth. You should probably know those, go back and write that down. But what's neat is if you put them on a map, you'll notice there's a certain pattern. So this would be the global guilt map of nations. But here's what it would look like if you could just see the CO2. I think that's pretty amazing. When I say this, some of you should think, well, what about the people, right? Like China makes a lot, but you know, they, they make double the CO2, but they've got like six times as many humans. And so this is an interesting thing. What if you take the national total and then you divide it among the people? That's called per capita, like per person, per head. And yeah, China's a huge percentage, the number one percentage of the global emissions. That is the most kilotons of CO2 made by any nation, more than double the US, which is more than double India. But there's a ton of people dividing that. So per person, the average Chinese person, is less than half of the average American person. And like, that's kind of a lot, but India has a whole lot of people. So actually per person, India's contribution is really minor. In case you're curious, a few countries in the Middle East are even worse. And surprisingly, Canada is even worse than the United States because their homes require a lot of heating, right? Canada's um, up more north than we are. So like we've got a few people that use a lot of home heating. Keep in mind, all Canadians use more. So anyway, um, the countries that make the most per person, if you map that, there's a few that I've never understood. And maybe you could tell me why Belize? Why Trinidad and Tobago, I think? The Persian Gulf ones we understand. You know, Dubai, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, um, a lot of air conditioning, a lot of desalination. Um, so uh, if you look at the history of a country, the United States has made the most cumulative CO2. I hope that makes sense, the most cumulative CO2 it was made by the United States. So over the history of the nation, keep in mind, we built a country that built the world economy that started right at the rise of the industrial age. See, a lot of these countries maybe have a long history but haven't had a lot of industrialization. We were a country that built industrialization and then leveraged that through more than a century of growth. So in the history of countries, we are by far the most CO2 emission here in the United States. That was a lot of details and I have to warn you, you have to take a lot of notes in this one. Um, methane is the second anthropogenic greenhouse gas. This is the fart one. You know, you can light your farts because anaerobic decomposition. Um, we've more than tripled so there was 700 parts per billion in the atmosphere. We're pushing 2,000 now. Um, these are basically unprecedented levels. There's never been this much in the history of life, except the mass extinctions. When ecology changes, you get a lot of decomposition. Um, here's a crazy thought. Methane is way hotter than CO2. Remember, um, the vibrations of CO2 right? So CO2 is chilling, you heat it up and it starts to vibrate. When those bonds stabilize, that heat is radiated. Now, methane, when you heat it up, it gets really unstable. 
and then that methane will restabilize and give off 10 times more heat. So if you look at the elasticity of the bonds in CO2 versus the elasticity of the bonds in CH4, methane is stretchier, it holds more energy, it can destabilize more. So it's important to know that uh, methane is 10 times hotter than CO2 per molecule. And that's why we burn natural gas when it's vented at an oil rig or something like that. Um, maybe you know, um, like if you're driving down Rincon, there's that fire ball of death on the left. Or if you see the oil rigs at night, they make these huge red flames. Uh, you should know these sources, and I have to go fast. The number one source is literally farting cows. Uh, red meat is supposed to eat grass. That makes them really lean, and nobody likes lean meat. We like marbled fatty meat. I know I like that. So we give our cows eating disorders. We feed them stuff they can't digest, and they pack on fat. We give them too much sugar. And when you give them too much sugar, they fart too much. So whether the fart happens in their body or in the manure left on the ground, that's the number one source of methane. That's how we are raising this. Also, farming in rice paddies has a lot of anaerobic decomposition in those shallow ponds. Um, when we dry up wetlands and other changes to land use, um, you know, leaks and vents, natural gas, methane is natural gas. So any leaks that we have in fossil fuel, those add to the atmosphere. And melting permafrost is low now, Remember methane hydrate, methane molecules trapped in water because you have decomposition when ice is being formed. Um, melting permafrost will rise as the planet gets hotter. The contribution from that is gonna go up. Now, nitrous oxide is a relatively small amount of our heating. We have raised that in a pretty substantial amount. Um, and you should probably know in your notes that this is a byproduct of fertilizing, whichever fertilizer you use. Remember that nitrogen cycle we talked about that looks like a lowercase n? So fixation, assimilation, decomposition, nitrification and denitrification. In that chemistry, we left out some stuff to keep it simpler. If you look at all the details, when you add a bunch of stuff that decomposes, a lot of nitrous oxide comes out of the ground. Tropospheric ozone is one of the other gases. We make a lot of pollution that causes wobble. So sulfur dioxide wobble uh, vibrates, uh, nitrogen dioxide vibrates, and ozone vibrates. It's important to point out, this is the right time to say this, that ozone is good in the stratosphere, toxic in the troposphere. So where it occurs naturally, it benefits us. Where we make it, it's dangerous for us. There is some natural ozone down here, lightning strikes and volcanoes, but we are adding more. And you should know that ozone is what we call a secondary pollutant. The stuff that comes out of the tailpipe is primary pollution, but those ingredients play in the atmosphere to make new stuff that's secondary pollution. So we don't emit ozone directly, and you have to know this in your notes. We don't emit ozone directly we emit the ingredients that party to make ozone. Because it's toxic, ozone levels are dropping. One that you really have to know about is fluorinated gases. They're also called halons or industrial greenhouse gases. And what makes them special is that fluorine. See how they all have an F? Now these are really crazy because they're big molecules with really stretchy bonds. Fluoride, fluoride bonds are super stretchy. So these are entirely man-made, they didn't exist before. And when we add them, they trap tremendous amounts of heat, like maybe 20,000 times more than CO2. So these are extremely rare, but they're responsible for a lot of heating. Um, I wish I had more time. I have students starting to show up in my room and I have to finish this video so that I have a lot of kids that are absent today. Um, now, if you combine all greenhouse gases globally, you'll get the main sources are manufacturing and construction, transportation, 
So this is roads, ocean, air, and other types of transportation. Residential and commercial is pretty significant. Agriculture and land use are pretty significant. And I always think that this one is fascinating. How much CO2 is made just to produce the energy that will later make more CO2. You probably should know this one in your notes, that of the carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous, and halons, the two that have grown are CO2 and halons those fluorinated gases. Methane and nitrous oxide have been pretty consistent. One last thing in study goal 19 is the idea of radiative forcing, like how much heat is reflected by each of these gases. And you can see that the most heat is being reflected by CO2. But look at how much we get from those minor ones and from the fluorinated ones more slide to show you and then I got to stop because kids are showing up. Um, if you look at all the things that humans do, we are driving climate change primarily through CO2 and methane. There's a few things that we do that would be reversing climate change, like we add dust which blocks light. Or we add dust that makes clouds form and then clouds block light. So there are actually negative forcers that come from humans but the positive forcers are much bigger. I really sincerely apologize. Um, this is gonna get confusing. I uh, think I got all this beyond an exam, but I need to stop this recording now.